Imagine a still, frozen world. It's ancient, about 4.5 billion years old. It's barely heated by the rays of the sun and covered with a thick layer of ice. This world is smaller than our moon, but a bit larger than Pluto. Its name is Europa, the sixth satellite of Jupiter and one of the biggest moons in the solar system. But the coolest thing about this faraway place, it might host life. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking missions to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Interestingly, the new discovery about these shallow pools came about by sheer luck. The scientist leading the research, Riley Kohlberg, accidentally saw a presentation of his colleague, a planetary scientist. That scientist showed a picture of double ridges on the surface of Europa, and Kohlberg remembered that he had seen similar ridges on Earth. But while such formations are rare on our planet, they are way more numerous on Europa. The following studies suggested that the ridges on Jupiter's moon might be the result of a specific cycle, similar to that on Earth. In this cycle, liquid water freezes and then thaws inside an ice sheet, which is a rather high-pressure environment. This causes the sheet to move upward over and over again, creating a two-peaked structure. Or at least, that's what happens on Earth. If the processes on Europa are similar, it can prove the presence of shallow waters on the satellite. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa. And scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water pockets are, or how long they need to refreeze. But what is more or less clear is that such under-ice environments on Europa are very likely to be protected from Jupiter's harsh radiation battering the satellite's surface which, in turn, increases the chances of life existing on Europa. Now, can we get back to the fact that the ocean on Europa seems to be salty? Red streaks on the satellite's surface might have this color due to their chemical content. They're likely a frozen mixture of water and salts. This is quite unusual because such a composition doesn't match any known substance here on Earth. As for yellow spots on Europa's surface, those might be caused by the presence of sodium chloride, you know this substance as good old table salt. Scientists tried to recreate the conditions on Europa in a lab. They discovered that by combining water, table salt, freezing temperatures, and high pressure, they could get a new kind of solid crystal. This substance might exist both at the bottom of Europa's ocean and on the moon's surface. But besides this information, researchers are in the dark. Hopefully, we'll find the answers to some of these questions around 2030. That's when a mission called Europa Clipper, which is going to be launched by NASA, will probably reach Europa. The mission is going to have several close flybys and figure out if any form of life can exist on the moon. The European Space Agency's JUICE, which stands for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is going to visit Europa in the next couple of years too. Movies have been lying to us. All these epic space scenes actually take place in an awkward silence. Who would have guessed? But don't get upset. What if I tell you there are, in fact, some ways to hear sound in space? First of all, there's still sound on other planets. If there's an atmosphere on a space body, or at least something like gas, water, or a solid surface, there will be sound. In our case, the atmosphere becomes completely silent at about 60 miles above the Earth's surface. That's where the sky stops being blue and a black starry veil begins. 
In any case, we'd have to land on another planet, or at least get close to its atmosphere to hear something. But whatever it is, it would sound very different. Let's take our favorite Venus as an example. The atmosphere there is very dense. Scientists jokingly call it a thick chemical soup. No thanks. So, if you somehow managed to stay alive and speak there, your voice would be very different. It would become much louder, and it would sound deeper. So, if you want a pleasant baritone, you know what to do. I wonder what would happen if Earth had a denser atmosphere. What would we hear then? Well, you can vaguely imagine that if you've ever been in the water. Water is very dense. Sound moves there much faster and better compared to the air, at a speed of almost a mile per second, depending on the water temperature. So if you sit in an empty room with no sound sources, you won't hear much, right? Now, dip your head in the water and check out how the same silence sounds here. It's not quiet at all. Even if you ignore the ever-present sounds of the water itself, you'll immediately notice how well you can hear your own body, how your blood pulsates in the veins, how your heart works, the slightest movement of your fingers. Kind of creepy, isn't it? This gives us an idea of what would happen to us on a planet with a denser atmosphere. And that's just crazy. We would hear everything. From scurrying animals to the movement of tectonic plates. Ah, come on, you'd probably say. It's obvious that there's sound on other planets. But didn't you say we can hear something in open space? Actually, yes. For example, in a cloud of dust. You can find space dust almost everywhere in space. It may be the remains of a star or something else. And in these places, everything is a bit denser than usual. This means there are probably dust clouds where particles are very close to each other, which means they can produce sounds. Of course, those will be very quiet and transmitted over a very short distance. But it's better than nothing, right? Plus, we already have one real space sound recorded. It came from the Perseus galaxy, which is located 250 million light-years away from us. NASA recorded it in 2003. Those of us music geeks will want to know that it's a B-flat, 57 octaves below middle C on the piano. You'd have to add another 660 keys to the left on the keyboard. But its frequency is so low that the human ear unfortunately can't hear it. But besides that, we can only hear something inside spaceships. These are small pockets of air, after all. In a spacesuit, you would hear sounds very well, too, including your breathing or blood circulation in a spacesuit. But two astronauts flying side by side wouldn't hear each other, even if they got very close and shouted very loudly. It's quite funny. If you, being an astronaut, bumped into something, it would be very loud for you, but your friend wouldn't hear anything. That's why astronauts use radio devices. 291, 291, cast your call to a 79 will handle. Now, purely theoretically, if you could somehow crawl out of your spacesuit and survive, you'd be able to hear the chatter and noises going on inside the spaceship. But how? So look, we have some air inside the spaceship, and it transmits sound. It reaches the metal casing and gets through it. And then, if you leaned against the ship, preferably touching it with your elbow or knee, the sound would be transmitted to the brain directly through your bones, ignoring the ears. Yes, our bones conduct sound. That's how, for example, deaf people listen to music. It's called bone conduction. It's used in some headphones and some other technologies. You can do a little experiment. Hold your fingers over your ears. Shut them properly so that you really don't hear much. Then try to touch a sound source. It can be anything vibrating. For example, a speaker playing music with some part of your body where the bone is close to the skin. Now, watch the miracle happen. You can hear the sound not through your ears, but directly in your brain. But please, don't repeat this experiment in open space. You know, ice cream? Haha. <laughs> Now, you've probably heard about things like the sounds of space, where you can listen, for example, to the sounds made by the sun or different planets. How do we record these ones? Easily. There is another way to hear sound in space, electromagnetic waves. In other words, a radio. Radio is the same form of electromagnetic radiation as light. 
These waves can travel in a vacuum without any problems. Astronauts' transmitters work that way. An astronaut says something to their friend. The sound waves turn into radio waves, reach the other person, and are then converted back into sounds. And this is how we get so-called space sounds. Our planet is actually very loud in that regard. We're sending a huge amount of radio waves into the universe, all radio signals we've ever listened to. It's a pity that they travel only 110 light years away from us. But you know, I think it's good that we don't hear everything that happens in space. Imagine if sound could easily travel through the universe? We would hear everything, from solar flares to nearby supernovas. Horrifying, right? So maybe we're just lucky. Hey, remember, in space, you can hear ice cream. Chocolate! If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around the eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry, so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, that's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen. And since there's not any in space, well... Once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow has survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP40-365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. A white dwarf is a star that burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. If you ever go into space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. <laughs> Small comfort. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. This happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time, squeeze it into another, like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like for a billion suns, but luckily, it's far away from us. If you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yes, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battles in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. Sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you, the sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the second, third, and so on, until the wave reaches your ear. So, to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine, but space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. So, to carry on a conversation, you'd either need a radio or really good lip-reading skills. Meteoroids orbit the sun, while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. And there's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the other 70% of the universe. Hmm, that adds up to 100, right? Now, let's look at the moon. It always looks at us with one side. This means the moon has a dark side, and the sun's rays never get there. Well, that's a myth. 
The whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. There are days and nights there, too. It's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the Earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you only see one side. Although there are days when the sun shines there, too, so it's not the dark side, it's the far side. And we even have pictures of this place. And there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system, the South Pole Aiken Basin. It's as wide as two states of Texas. Yeehaw! One myth that turned out to be untrue is that people have never actually been on the moon. This is the original spacesuit of the first astronauts who were there. Look at the sole of the shoe. Some people claim there's no way they could have left footprints like this there. Actually, they could. On the moon, the astronauts wore extra boots over their suits, and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly. Now, the astronauts didn't need them when they left the moon and tossed them when the moonwalk was over. They left a lot of stuff there, too. They even tossed the armrests of the seats in the lunar module to reduce the weight. Now, counting all the Apollo lunar missions, the total weight of rubbish on the moon is approximately 187 tons, including several lunar rovers, spacecraft debris, six lunar modules, and all the experiments left behind. That's like three Boeing 737s. Another myth about the sun is that it's yellow. Let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and it's white. The sun only appears yellow to us through the filter of our atmosphere. The composition of the air and its thickness just distorts the light of the star. But stars do come in different colors. Cooler stars have bright orange and red colors. These are usually very old stars, older than our sun. But young and very hot stars are bright blue. The sun is about in the middle of the spectrum. Oh, one more myth about asteroids. We need to fly a little farther than Mars's orbit. Whoa, we're in an asteroid belt. And we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice. We got in some dense asteroid clouds. Hmm, not true. The fact is that space is huge, and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon. So there really aren't that many of them there. To understand the dimension of the emptiness in space, look at the collision of two galaxies. There are billions of stars in each of them. If we mix them up, it's unlikely there will be any collisions even here. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.